My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. Today is January 16th, 2022. It's Sunday. Um, we are shooting at the Hilton Garden Inn in Tampa, Florida. And Sarah, what is your name? Yeah, my name is uh, Vincent Bugs, Brigadier Retired General Vincent Bugs. Okay. And what branch of the service did you serve in? I was in the U.S. Army. Okay, and what year did you go into the Army? I went in uh, June 1990. Okay, um, where were you living at the time? I was living at the time I was in Statesboro, Georgia, a graduate of Georgia Southern University. Okay, and what state is that? Uh, Georgia. Georgia. Okay, um, what were you majoring in? I was majoring in history and minor in German at the time. And I take it you used your degree to enter the, into the service? I actually did, yes. Okay. And uh, what, so what rank you went in, I guess you started out as, as a lieutenant? Yeah, for a uh, second lieutenant and commissioned uh, ROTC. Okay, all right. And that, well, from high school or college? Uh, from college. Mm -hmm. right. And the Army ROTC program? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, all right. And I think you said it already, but what did you major in again? Uh, history and, uh, right. and a minor in German. Right. German? Yes, German. You speak German fluently? So I can see the voice. Nice. Yeah. Very good, very good. So, um, uh, basic training, uh, officer's training school? I did, um, we went officer training school as quartermaster. I went uh, quartermaster school, and then after quartermaster, I went quartermaster advance, and you know, further on in my career. Okay, and how long was officer's training school? All right, so for me, I was quartermaster. So I went quartermaster from February of 91 to June of 91, and then, and then I started my career as a, a second lieutenant. Okay. And how long was it? How long was the training? Six months. Okay. Um, so you um, you went to another more training after that for your no, MOS? No. So for our officers, it's, it's, it's a little different. Then we uh, do our officer battery tests at ROTC. Uh, we go to what they call advanced camp. Then you get selected for what your MOS is going to be. Once you graduate ROTC, you get your MOS school. You apply. So, and instead of going to like a, a basic training at AIT, we go to our MOS school. So we go straight to our MOS school after ROTC, and then we uh, do our five and a half months, six months uh, time there, and then we start our. We go to our first assignment. Okay. Please uh, share what your instructors are like in. Both in your training program. All right, so uh, great question. I mean, one I got in ROTC because of um, um, Master Sergeant Woodfield. Uh, he was a great, he was a great guy. He used to bother me on at George Southern Campus every chance he got, and, and got me into ROTC. But when I got in ROTC, I kind of I got in kind of late, so you have to go what they call advanced camp. So I ended up going to excuse me basic camp. So I went to basic camp, and this is where I really met two drill sergeants, Drill Sergeant Hopkins and Irvine, who. Uh, uh, it really changed my life, and uh, they put me through the uh, training process of becoming an officer, which is kind of similar to basic training, uh, and or kind of like the officer and the gentleman, the uh, the movie like Officer and Gentleman where they go to OCS. So they put you in that process of deciding whether you want to really be in the military. Once you finish that, you go back to school, you finish up your last two years of college, then you go to advanced camp. And I went to Fort Riley for advanced camp, finished that uh, a mission. And the instructors were really good. I had a uh, Master Sergeant Mikado at advanced camp, and uh, he was probably one of the best NCOs I ever worked with, trained me, and then I went on to get commissioned uh, quartermaster, and then I went off to quartermaster school. Okay. Um, let's see. Give me a minute. That's all right. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what was your first duty assignment after that? All right, so I was I was commissioned. And this is a unique process. I was commissioned reserve because back in the early uh, '90s, the Army wasn't taking a lot of active duty people, so I got commissioned reserve. And so my first actual assignment was my reserve uh, unit in uh, Germany, which was a uh, uh, RAOC, which was a rear area operations center, and I was a second lieutenant in that in that unit. So what we do is uh, we go out, do field assessments, make sure that units that were coming to the field would be stationed in the right areas that they were supposed to be staged in. And so as second lieutenant, I was going through the process of becoming a supply officer, 
and, and, and just going through those uh, the dynamics of learning my job. And, and so my first assignment was Kaiser Slider in Germany in the 313th uh, RAIOC unit at uh, Panzer Concern. Okay, I understand you said that um, you were in an ROTC program. Yes. And I guess I'm a, I take it for granted it was an Army ROTC program. That is correct. But was, was that the branch of service that you actually wanted to go into? Oh, I'm an Air Force brat. So I started out at Louisiana Tech and I thought I was going to go into Air Force, but then I did my math and I was finding out, okay, how many people get pilot, get selected for pilot? How many people get A-10s? Because I wanted to be an A-10 pilot. And uh, when they told me what the numbers were and the chances of me ever being able to fly an A-10 were, were, were really hard, I decided to convert over to Army and then I ended up transferring to Georgia Southern, got in the Army ROTC, uh, and then didn't start, you know, started my career there and ended up doing 30 years in the Army. Wow. Congratulations. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, okay, how old were you when you went into service? Oh, I was, uh, I was 25 when I actually entered my first duty station. And what year was that again? Uh, first, my, uh, it was 1991 is when I finally finished OBC, and then about 92 I got to my first duty station. Okay, well where I'm going is, as a person of color, as a black man, Right. what obstacles, I'm curious, at, your, at that age, right. at, at the age of 25, did you sense or feel any obstacles due to the fact that you're a black man? Well, in the military, in the military, uh, well, you know, I'm glad you, you brought that up here, here. The challenge I had was lack of knowledge. And I, I felt that unless you were an officer's kid or, you know, and being at Georgia Southern, uh, you know, we were still They're still going through some transitions of uh, African-Americanism, um, uh, you know, African-Americans being in the system and then, you know, becoming officers because we're such a minority in the officer corps. Mm -hmm. Now, now, as big as the officer corps is, we are, we, back in the 80s, uh, we were a huge minority uh, just in numbers. And um, so, yeah, there, there was always, a, and you felt that you weren't getting the information that other students were. Like, I didn't know about SMP. No one brought that. You know, What's SMP? Uh, SMP is like when you are in ROTC, you can work in a National Guard unit and get extra pay. So there was like, it wasn't the out, overt discrimination. It was just the lack of information was not spread throughout the whole command for everybody to know. So so was a lot of times I found out a lot of minorities that they, unless they were nested with someone that came up in the system, they were unaware of other opportunities to make uh, extra money while they were in ROTC. And I, and I just happened to be the ones that got one of the minimum uh, payments. And once I graduated and realized how much money I could have made, how much uh, I could have helped my career out by being in in, a, uh, in the National Guard or being in different programs or being assigned to a reserve unit while I was in ROTC uh, would, would have helped me out a lot. But because of that, I didn't know, and so and some of it could play out either way. Okay, I'm curious to know. So you mentioned okay, so you feel like there was like an undercurrent. In, in other words, you know, I, I don't really like using the term elephant in the room, <laughs> but, you know, you had some intrepidation. Can but, you expound on that? Yeah, please? you know, when I step back now, uh, uh, these years later, and look at it, I had two really good instructors that helped out a lot, and uh, and one was uh, Jessica uh, Wright, but she, I got, she got there too late as I was getting ready to leave, right? and she ended up being a major general in the uh, aviation. But... Uh, she was very a wealth of knowledge, and it was kind of like if she had if she had been there during the time of my infancy of ROTC, I think I would have learned a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the couple of individuals that were there, they weren't privy on sharing a lot of knowledge. So it, it, is it clandestine due to race, or is it clandestine due to favoritism? Is it clandestine due to uh, you know pick or choose whoever? Um, there's sometimes you feel get that feeling as a minority that there's information sometimes given that you're never given uh, that could have helped you and you sometimes do feel internally and I felt internally at times that because of uh, sometimes because of my my skin color that I wasn't afforded certain pieces of knowledge that you know other students were afforded because there wasn't that many minorities at the time 
in ROTC. We did have a major. I mean, we did have a, a, a nice group, but we weren't a majority by any means. Do you have any statistics on that, by the way, as far as the ratio? No, uh, at this time, no, because it was so long ago. I, 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 I just knew that it was probably, I think, five of us out of the 13 that we had. It more could be more. I think it was... A, it didn't, I'm really not good with the numbers, so I don't want to even quote But it was definitely that. at least less than 10%. I yes. mean, less than 50%. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, why did you want to go into the service anyway? <laughs> well, my grandfather fought in World War II. Um, my dad was a Vietnam vet. And and my grandfather, I saw the, the, the opportunities that the minorities have. Being from Louisiana, the lack of opportunities for young black men were, were, were in high numbers. That you either, most of them I, I met that were in the neighborhood where my grandmother was, where they, they were on the street. They weren't really working they were, or hustling back in the day in the 70s, as they call it. Um, so the service showed me that African Americans actually could make a positive uh, move in life and that there were conditions that if they could meet certain conditions that they could get promoted and and just you know it gave opportunity so from my standpoint um, it was a safe bet for a career uh, before I decided whatever I was going to do as a civilian that the military was an option for me to, to, to you know make a good benchmark make good money but also um, give me an opportunity in an environment that I'm not going to say even playing field, so don't, don't you know? I know some people would be out there listening to this, going, I mean, "This not even playing, not even playing field," but actually give you a better a, a better chance than what you would if you came out of college with a degree, trying to get a job, uh, and within within the corporate America, and you know, and get a fair shake. So back then we were still going through transitions because you got to remember the '60s. The '60s had just ended. And we're in the 70s, and people are still reeling from civil rights, still reeling from Vietnam, still reeling from all these different social and political issues that we had in the country. And and young black men were, were being incarcerated, uh, were being incarcerated at high numbers back when in the 80s when I started school, you know. And so the military was an option not to be incarcerated, you know. And I didn't want to be a statistic. You know? And my mom was very, very clear. That she did not want me to end up being a statistic on the streets. I understand um, the term that you just used, level the playing field. I'm curious, um, with your success, right? From that time, <clears throat> excuse me, from that time, from that moment to this moment, do you believe that that's changed? Has it gotten worse? Is it balanced? You know, has it improved? Oh, you know. That's a great question because it, it goes to me from my standpoint, and I can only speak from my journey. It goes it, it goes through through whatever the political process is, who the political leaders are at the time at the highest levels of, of our country, and watching my uh, ascend, you know, my gradual graduation up to the general officer corps. There was a lot of bumps in the road, and 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 I'm going to go back to uh, General Austin. Clearly, put it out in his sixty in his sixty minutes. Um, interview that he just had about how, you know, even though you're African American, even though you were well versed and well articulated, it's awkwardly funny how at times that you're put in positions where you don't seem to have you being treated with the same respect that someone of non, of non colors being treated. Um, and I went through that, I mean, when he brought that speech and when he put that interview together, my, I just reflected, and on Colin Powell's situation that he wrote in his first book, I just reflected on those same moments because it was like deja vu. Is that the moment, sit in a room sometimes being the only minority and no one listens to you uh, is, um, is unique. And there are people say, well, it has nothing to do with color. But it's funny is that you would see people that have lesser um, uh, solutions and they're like, oh, that's a great idea. So there is something to be said that if you ask the question, has it gotten, is it worse? From the time it was in the, I was in the 90s, I saw the struggles to when right now as I got, I've retired, I would say it's definitely gotten worse and there's less representation at the highest level. And when people look at the numbers, they'll say, oh, well, these numbers are this. But when I say less rep representation, I mean four stars of color make a difference in the military. And when you have less people of variety at the top level, um, Admiral Mullen said it best, ducks pick ducks. 
And so it may not be overt racism. It may not have anything to do with racism, but people pick what they're comfortable with. And when you look around, they're comfortable with what people that look like them. So it's a large mass of, of confirmation bias that's transcending our, our military right now. And from my perspective, from my opinion, and that confirmation bias is actually hurting the, the, the junior force. If you don't mind me asking, um, I'm a few years older than you are. When I, was, um, when I was a little boy, I remember very clearly, um, back in uh, like around 63 to 68, I'll say 1963 to 68, the, um, the conversation beginning about the browning of America. Yes. And so this is 2022, and I'd just like to get your opinion, if you don't mind, okay. is how, how, where do you think that we stand today in a country of approximately 330 million people? Right, 330 million. Uh, when I was a little boy, it was about a quarter of a million. I mean, uh, 250 million people. So this is 80 million people later, so to speak. Right. And so I'm just, just curious how much the, the demographic mm -hmm. of this country, uh, do you, you feel like it's more or less black and white well i, I think the, the the better terms that i put in is that, that, that the struggle of more education less incarceration we have been incarcerated more young african-american males at a higher rate from the from the high school level from the middle school to high school level which means that they have their their opportunities are gone mm -hmm. from where they would normally have them and so we've we've done a a horrendous job as a society of ensuring that we put education first, which means that we put the, the proper uh, tools and instruments, the, the the proper applications in place for people to get educated. I love how um, our society always says, well, we're putting 18 million or whatever number we want to throw at in towards education. But my question always comes back, how much infrastructure, how much of that infrastructure money is being put into communities of color that need, that are struggling to get them out of a certain level? Um, we, the Browning of America is, is, is a, it was a great term from the 70s in that, that we were trying to see that where people of color sit as far as going up and having jobs that are, you have a, what I call a livable wage. Uh, we are still struggling with that. Uh, there, there is no one that can convince me in, that Amer African Americans aren't struggling with the livable wage. We've seen it during the, the pandemic and, and I've seen it as I was growing up. I've, I've been blessed that my family had a military background and that some of our grandparents and my parents made some different cho life choices that allowed us to be able to get a very good education. But that is not, when you look at it holistically as the uh, people of color, we've got to do a better job. And it starts within our own community, but as well as also legislation and making sure laws are being put in place that are helping kids go to college or go to trade schools as opposed to being incarcerated. Okay. Okay, so back to your um, military life. Okay. Um, okay, so you said that I think your first duty base was Kaiserslautern. Yeah, <laughs> Kaiserslautern, Germany. How long? How long was that tour? Uh, because uh, I was a reserve officer, I had a civilian job with uh, AFES. Uh, um, the arm was it the uh, Air Force Army Exchange uh, System uh, store. Because I was a, a, a reserve, a, a reservist, I was working as a civilian over there, and then I started working a uh, DOD job as uh, working for the sports center. But uh, I worked in that reserve unit for about six years. I was there between uh, two different commands while I was in Germany, and it was a good experience. I mean, um, in Europe, um, I'm learning my craft as a as a uh, military officer. But then uh, eventually I applied for active duty, and, and unknown to me, I ended up getting selected for active duty. And after that, the rest of the time I was in, I was in active duty. And my first duty assignment was Wausau, Wisconsin, now on active duty at, at an Army Reserve Center. And what was your, what was your job there? Uh, as I got there, I was a support operations officer. So my, my job was to support active duty units or support any units that are in the field that needed logistic support because there was back then we had divisional and non-divisional units and so non-divisional units needed support and those that those units were supported by support operations units how long was the tour there uh, my tour was three years in Wisconsin okay going back to Kaiserslautern um, well I believe that you you um, we 
had an earlier conversation about the fact that you did a lot of growing up in Germany, correct? <laughs> yes, I did. So now you're stationed there so many years later. So what would your relate what were your relationships like with the people on the economy? Oh, starting with the Germans. And I, I I believe I can take it for granted that you also have been around Europe, so to speak. Right. I mean so the preface um with the local, the local nationals, with the Germans, my life was a little bit easier because during the 70s, and, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, um, in 1970, after the Tillman issue, uh, Emmett Tillman issue in uh, Mississippi, my mother uh, feared, always had feared for me being her only boy and, and definitely being in the South and, and, you know, and at any point that she realized that someone could uh, harm me. Uh, she made a conscious decision with my dad to move to Germany mm -hmm. uh, and get stationed in Germany after he left Vietnam. And so we spent a majority of our life in Europe away from the uh, South. And, and, and that was a, a hard, a unique decision by a very young woman. Uh, and so we, our first duty assignment was Hope. So as I grew up in Germany and then I went back as an officer, I kind of spoke the language and I knew my way around Europe a little bit, Italy and Germany and France really well that it, it, my assimilation in Europe was really good. Where my struggle actually was, was in my unit. Uh, my first duty assignment was, uh, was a learning lesson uh, because of personalities, um, because of the, the way people predicated leadership. And, and it was the first, I would say, and I'm going to use the term toxic leadership that I'd ever been around and, and, and massive confirmation, favoritism, and bias. Uh, and I was out of the unit, people in the unit, I think there was like maybe four African Americans in the unit of probably about 40, 40 or 60 people. Um, and so the struggling is on the officer side, there was two African American officers in the total, in the whole unit. And I was a second lieutenant at the time. And I was faced with some challenges of the, the person I worked for. Um, they, they felt that they knew everything and I was good with that. They were a senior officer to me. But what was funny is that they did not keep themselves versed in their craft. And so at times when I would try to give them advice after coming out of OBC on the latest things, there was always a uphill struggle. So I, I kind of got undermined a little bit. Now I want kind of went through some of the stuff Colin Powell talks about in his book about how, how people view you. So it, it was a learning lesson and it was some of the, it, as bad as and hard as it was, it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me because it made me realize that just because we wear the uniform, everybody doesn't have great intentions for everybody in the circle of brotherhood or sisterhood in the army. Okay. And by the way, where did, um, where what, what other countries did you visit while you were stationed in Kaiserslautern? <laughs> well, I got to go to Switzerland. Uh, got to go to France, Montpellier. Um, I, I did. I, I I really traveled to Europe. Where's Montpellier? France? France. France. South France. So I really got to go to a, a lot of places and I broadened myself and I even uh, went to uh, uh, England. So I, I really was able to broaden my aperture on culture, broaden my aperture on, on understanding uh, the politics of other countries. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So after Kaiserslautern, you went where? Oh, after Kaiserslautern right now, I ended up going to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And yeah. how long was that tour? All right, it was three years in Wisconsin, right. and then I left Wisconsin and went to Arkansas. Okay, up until this point, uh, did you ever have any issues with being able to stay in touch with your family back home? Where, where, you know, where, where were you? Your parents, I know you've already expressed that um, in previous conversation that... Um, they're in different parts of the world, so help me out here. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's a little hard to keep up. You, you're talking, you're talking pre pre internet. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, we, we the Pony Express was the way we stayed in touch. Yeah, the old uh, old letter writing and mailing the letter here and there cards. One of the other things that we also did on a regular basis was we call every day. But you know, back then, long distance calls cost a lot of money. So we call when we had opportunities. We we call and talk to each other. But overall, you know, we go three, four months without talking just because, you know, internet hadn't really got there yet. Right. We had, and so, but, you know, my mom is a, is a unique woman. She makes sure that, uh, that, that we don't go off the radar <laughs> too far. 
because all of us were in my sister was a lieutenant colonel oh, at the okay. time in uh in the air force and then my other sister was working her husband was in the air force so they were stationed in uh san antonio at the time they were stationed in arkansas then they went to san antonio and then um and then my other sister was at home she was the youngest one she was at home so so my mom had to make sure she kept her hands on all of us even though we were long distance because my mom actually was living still living in germany when I was stationed in uh, Wisconsin and in Arkansas. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so after Wisconsin, next Arkansas. duty station. Yeah, I went to uh, Camp Robinson, Arkansas, uh, Camp Pike for the federal side. How long were you there? Uh, we were, I was there three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was a good assignment. Uh, first time I was around, uh, uh, a, a probably a 50 50 percent. Uh, mixed population of the army everybody mm -hmm. was, it, was, it was you know a large majority of african americans large majority of european americans uh hispanic americans uh and it, it was actually a really nice time because I, I learned a majority of my military skill sets being stationed in arkansas under warnus lambert under glenn eddins and under uh, 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 colonel morgan and colonel stratton they they really gave me a lot of latitude to do my job it was the first time I actually felt like I was. It was inclusive in what I was doing and and, and giving latitude to uh, to be a free thinker. Um, Wisconsin, at the, uh, part of my career there was. I wanted to be, do want to say there was a. It was a, uh, ended up being a Colonel McFarland and Colonel Savage. Without those two, I probably would have uh, got out of the army. They they really supported me and um, that nest of people probably set my foundation for for my in my career. Why do you say you would have gotten out if they hadn't supported you? Because um, when I was in Wisconsin, same, you know, same dialogue, being the only African American there at the time, there was one uh, Panamanian and one Hispanic guy who worked there. Majority of everything was everybody was ninety eight percent European American. Just a lot of struggles with uh, with uh, just you know undercurrent uh, some of it racism within the command. Uh, some of it, you know, uh, just people were comfortable with each other. And I was at my wit's end of wanting to stay in the army after being after the situation in Germany. Um, and if it wasn't for Colonel McFarland and Colonel Savage, who told me the, to to stay on, stay, stay the course and stay the ship and not give up, uh, I probably would have got out, and I did. I did what they told me to do, and it, it worked out. Because you can, you know, as any person, even in your darkest hour, you gotta have somebody with some light talk to you to keep your your motivation and your and your uh, focus. Up. Next duty station. Oh, after uh, Arkansas was uh, Virginia, so we ended up going to uh, me and my wife. I got married, and we ended up, we ended up going to Virginia. Uh, Fort Belvoir. Um, sorry, but did you maintain the same MOS, same job? I, I so actually far? did. Oh, well, I was see the Army Reserve was going through a transition. So at one point, I was going infantry, and um, I transitioned. I was transitioning the infantry, and then the infantry was removed from the Army Reserve. So I ended up staying quartermaster. So pretty much, I stayed a loggy throughout my career. Even though I, I did about a year and a half as an infantry guy for a little bit. Okay. All right. So now we're in Virginia. Yep, Fort Belvoir. Okay. And what was your same job? No, I actually when I got to Fort Belvoir, I actually take uh, ended up becoming a uh, battalion XO, and I did that job at Ninth Theater Sustain, uh, Support Command. Uh, then while I was there, I ended up getting called up to go to Iraq because the Iraq War was uh, uh, 2005. I ended up getting called in to go to Iraq, so I left and went to Iraq. And refresh my memory, what's an XO again? Uh, I was executive officer. Uh huh. And so, what rank are you now? Captain, major? No, at the time I was a captain when I got there. And then I ended up getting promoted to major. Mm -hmm. And then when I got promoted to major, I ended up deploying for my first tour in Iraq. Um, How long was that tour? But, uh, well, it was gone 15 months because I went like five months. It was three months to train up and then 12 months in the in, in Ambar. And what year was that? 2005 to, I mean, uh, to, end of 2004 to, to 2005. And your job is now? At that time, I ended up becoming a, the assistant support operations officer for the 326 ASG. And uh, I was in Al-Assad, Iraq. Uh -huh. Casualties. 
Um, there were a lot of casualties. Not my unit. We only had one person that um, was killed in my unit. They were assigned to our unit to support us, and his name was uh, Samuel, Staff Sergeant Samuel Castle. He's a unbelievable comms uh, officer, uh, NCO, non-commissioned officer, excuse me, and um, and he was killed by IED. Are you at liberty to speak about any uh, battle planning that you may have been involved in? Um, we, we did support, so we supported the Marine Corps and we supported uh, any other uh, operators in the area. And that's that's like the limit I could talk to you. And those uh, and, uh, uh, we supported those guys when they, whatever mission they were doing for for the uh, Anbar area that we were in. Okay, so um, you um, you had the the terrible experience of the one casualty. And uh, so I'm asking you, um, from other organizations or other units, did you see a lot of uh, injuries oh, okay. and um, or casualties coming back from the field? Um, I did. Um, once Once we got in there, uh, the Marines had a couple of vehicles get destroyed, and I just happened to be go by and look at the BDR, the battle damage uh, from the vehicles, just to kind of get an idea. Um, a lot of photos from the guys that, that when we lost Castle um, because I wasn't out there when, um, when it, I was in Qatar that day when he uh, passed away. But there was a lot of funerals and um, we got attacked a lot. So there was multiple damages around where I lived. Uh, uh, the, the, the fuel yard got blown up. I mean, right behind my tent, my water container got blown up. So. Um, as far as uh, physically seeing someone lose their life, no. Uh, dealing with a lot of it afterwards, yes, because of uh, just the, the nature of the beast. And working in support ops, we're responsible for the angels, which means when there's a casualty, making sure that that person is escorted back to Kuwait. So there was a couple times that I was on different flights that I had to go on missions that we actually had angels on the flight. So I never. What is angels uh, on the flight? Angel is a um, when a, someone's a casualty and they were killed in action. So um, we were transporting. We were going on a mission, but there, uh, often that there would be caskets on the the, the C one thirties that we were on on those missions, going back to, out of the theater to into Kuwait. So it happened to me twice that I, we we were on a bird that was escorting angel. An angel. Okay. Um, next duty station. Um, after that, I came back to Belvoir. Went uh, went to uh, school for a little bit. Some extra training that we have to do. And then I went literally uh, six months or seven months to the date. I went right back in the box in like oh six, oh uh, end of oh seven oh eight, and I went to uh, back Baghdad this time. For how long? I was there. Uh, um, about shy of 12 months, so I was there about 10 and a half months. And um, the experiences, so you're back in Iraq. <laughs> really short, yeah, I had a short time at home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so you're, you're back in Iraq, and also I'd like to continue along that line of casualties. Okay. But also, um, I neglected to, before to ask you, did you have any interaction with the... Um, the natives, the people in the economy, the, uh, yeah. the Iraqis. Yes, because of the uh, service support, we had I had contractors working for me, not working for me, working with me. That's the better word to use. They're working with us and supporting what we needed done. Um, sadly, um, we lost a lot of those contractors. They were they were they were killed uh, by by the, the insurgents. But yeah, there was a, several that I was that I had got to know, and uh, and we lost them. It really kind of it kind of tore me up because they were they were very supportive in my first tour. Uh, in my second tour, um, I was at in, at the, at Baghdad at the at the palace, and it got attacked on a regular basis. And then one one day that's that will still remain. Well, two things that remain with me on that that tour was um, they dropped a bomb right out in front of the palace, and it um, it. it Injured a lot of people and it killed several people. Um, and just going down there in the aftermath of the blast, uh, when, I, when I came out of the palace, um, just the destruction and the uh, and the and the blood that was all over the place it, 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 from the people that were, were injured or killed. It was it was a it was a moving experience for me. Um, then it, later on, it, 
uh, one of my good, good friends, we were early in the morning where we were attacked, uh, and he was in an area that got blown up. And uh, just I happened to come in the office early, and I'll never forget this. I came in early, and he was sitting at his desk, and he didn't look right. And, and I asked him what was wrong, and he was just like, I was in that area. And he was he actually had, you know, shell-shocked. He was actually... Uh, you know, going through a process because he literally was right there where the bomb had blew up and he had got up and just wandered into the office. So we ended up getting him out of the office and going to get him some help and uh, and getting him straight because uh, I realized he was really shook up because other people had got hurt around him and he was the one person that actually didn't get hurt. So getting him some help really made a difference in my life and just, you know, understanding seeing that that process of you, you go through a, a lot of things, you know, you have to process a lot when you're in combat or dealing with combat issues. Uh, speaking of troops, uh, female casualties or experiences where female, uh, females who have, who have experienced, you know, what you've experienced by being there. Right. Um, any, um, any recollection of, of uh, the effect on women? Uh, from within the U.S. military. Right. So, I mean, I knew of people that I talked to, but I was never with any females that were in actual uh, combat except one female that was working with me. She had got wounded and she had a Purple Heart. Uh, we didn't know her really personally. I just, I happened to, a couple times had to go do certain th uh, missions with her or go on certain things. Uh, uh, afterwards, after she had been on her first tour, but in the first tour, I think it was two, 2003, she had got, got shot, and so she still had a piece of the bullet, and she had the Purple Heart, she carried one in her uh, back pocket, and, and we kind of talked about the experience, and so she was just saying that, you know, she stayed in, even after being wounded. Hmm. She was still in, and she was, uh, and, I mean, she was, she was a beast. I, I told her, I said, I had nothing but respect for her. Um, and she was still doing her time, but I know right now, by now, she's retired. But, you know, she was the first female that I actually had met that had, was actually had been wounded in action, shot in the side, and actually survived, and then, um, and had a Purple Heart. And, and, it, and it just showed me, you know, it just, you know, changed that perspective, that gun ho perspective that it's men only, you know, but that, you know, women are, 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 some, are some bad, Mamma Jammas, you know, <laughs> and get after it, you know. This just reminded me of my mom and how, how my mom's fortitude is and she and her fortitude of, of surviving, you know, being in an attack. Okay, um, next, so you were there for 12 months this time? Well, about just short of 12 months. Okay, yes. what was the next duty session? Uh, after that, I, I, we came back, we were in Virginia for a little bit. Then we went to uh, Georgia. Way? Me and my wife, family, family. Oh, okay. uh, you have family. any children? Oh yeah, I have five girls. Then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Com combat ops, man. Five girls, man. <laughs> Train you up. All right. Uh, okay. So you went back to Virginia? Yeah, I went back to Virginia. For how we, long? Uh, we went back for about a couple months, and we packed up, and we ended up going to Georgia. Uh, where? Uh, uh, Atlanta. We went to uh, 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 Fort McPherson. Job? Uh, I was at this time. I was a staff officer on staff for some, uh, doing supply uh, supply maintenance. Uh, I was a supervisor over you know Army Reserve equipment. So I did that job for about two years and ended up getting selected to go to Germany. I mean to Germany. I uh, know. Yeah, I ended up getting selected. Yeah, ended up getting selected again to go to Germany to be an XO for a brigade. So we left Atlanta, went to Germany. Uh, I was an XO for a brigade for about two and a half years, and then I got selected to go to Florida to CENTCOM, and then I ended up going to CENTCOM and being a plans officer until I went to War College. Until you went to war college. Mm -hmm. Next duty station? No, and after the war college, I No, no, no. Oh, oh. I mean, war college was the next duty station. Yeah, it was the next duty Where station. Where is that at? No, that was at, uh, um, I went to Air War College. So I ended up going to Air War College in Maxwell Air Force Base. In Alabama? In Alabama. And how long was that college? That was a year. That was a year. Okay, and what did that consist of? That consist of me uh, <laughs> knowing and loving that the Air Force has it really good. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they had a good, comfortable life. Sorry. I, mean, I know. I've been in Air Force, but I'm like, what was I thinking? No. 
So yeah, I went there and, and I, I got to get my strategic studies degree, and I met a lot of great people from the Air Force and the you know and the Navy and all that. It was joint, so I got to meet all these joint people, and um, it was a great time. And then we uh, worked through uh, our different projects there, and then we graduated with our strategic. Uh, um, studies degree, and then I went to my next duty station, which would be out in California. Base? Oh, it was, uh, the base was uh, Los Alamitos, uh, and it's the uh, Army Reserve there, right outside Seal Beach in um, Los Alamitos. And there I went as a, uh, the support, support operations officer for a Theater Sustainment Command. Okay, and how long were you there? Now, I was there, I was there three and a half, three and a half years, because mm -hmm. I ended up, uh, um, uh, working there three and a half years and working on, but even though I was stationed in California, I spent most of my time in Italy because we supported Africa Command, which is in, uh, in, in Germany and Italy, and we would uh, constantly be over on the continent of Africa doing, opera uh, doing operations and, uh, and uh, consulting with uh, African forces. What city were you near in Italy? Oh, uh, we were in Vicenza. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. How, how far uh, Rome? Oh, I can. My, most of my surgeons couldn't tell you today. I went out, <laughs> being the senior guy, to get to do all that. But they, we went to uh, we went to Vicenza. We were uh, so Venice is like I think twenty minutes up the street from us. And then, but Milan, uh, Milan, and all the other places were kind of like three hours, maybe two and a half hours away. Okay, and how long were you there? Uh, I was there. I was at that assignment like three and a half years. So what what was the um, what was the duty towards Africa? Did you have to travel to Africa? Uh, yeah, I went to. I actually got to go to Ethiopia and go to the Africa Union and and sit and work with the um, all the African uh, colonel African uh, colonels from the continent from different the different countries and sit down and just talk to them about um, just different missions, different things that they do. Um, how the uh, relationships are between the, the you know the different countries in Africa and you know and how colonialism impacted Africa. It was it was a it was really one of the one of the most pivotal times of my life where I literally I was in Addis Ethiopia Addis uh, to sit down and really understand the diaspora of Africa. Too many questions. Okay, okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, well, let's just go back to Italy for a minute. How was the food? Oh, yeah, come on. You know, you're in Italy. It's <laughs> Carb Central. I mean, who doesn't like the stone pizza? I mean, the food's great. I mean, uh, you're, you're talking Italy. The, the, the culture, you, you know, you just can't beat the artwork, the culture, uh, just the uh, the environment of just um, the, the just chilled atmosphere. Um, the job I actually had there was, even though it was high intense, it was it was uh, the, the leadership was just uh, really good. The, the leaders, the commanders of that of the unit there at the time, they were. It was just a really great group of people to work with to make things happen. I, I mean, the job was hard, but I loved it because the leadership supported uh, my teams, and and it was and it was a great. It was it was one of the check marks in my career. Speak, okay, so what was your rank by now? Uh, at that time, I was a colonel. Uh -huh. colonel. How many people were under your command? At the time, for me, because I was a support operations, I had about 128 people working for me. So going back to Africa, uh -huh. um, what kind of discussions were you having with Africans about colonialism? Um, we were, we discussed is that, that they still were, they still were uh, cleaning up some of the uh, the impacts of colonialism and how you know they even though they had been uh, transitioned in the 70s and transitioned in the 50s, they, there were still nuances of that system. That, not, and it wasn't so much the system; it's the culture that it brought and and the um, and so that you know they're trying to get away from a, of a little bit of dictatorshipism, capitalism, which is you know drives uh, people to be kind of greedy. And trying to bring balance so that the, the Africans could have uh, a little bit more balanced lifestyle is to the general population. Okay, um, and how long? How long did this tour last between um, between Italy and Africa? Oh, I, I, we did that that mission. What's well, still going on? But for me, it, I did it for about two and a half years. Okay. Um, any casualties between Italy and Africa? No, no, that, that, no, we didn't have any issues with that one. <laughs> next tour? Uh, next tour after leaving uh, that command, 
I ended up going to uh, back to CENCOM in, in, in Florida, Tampa, Florida, McDill Air Force Base and working for the J, J3 and it ended up being the LNO for UCOM and AFRICOM, ironically. So I, I was stationed in Stuttgart, Germany at the time and my job was to do um, bilateral um, discussions between UCOM, AFRICOM and uh, make sure that their equities, that CENCOM's equities were met by both of those command, uh, combatant commands. So we kind of worked between uh, as the one person in between two command, two separate commands on, on commodities. So like uh, if we had to have air assets or we had to share uh, medical assets if we had to share anything to make sure that whichever area of operation needed it that we could support each other. Okay. It was a cool job. So um, where are we now? We're in Stuttgart, Germany. Ah, okay. yeah. back to Germany. Yeah, yeah, and then when I finished up there, I, while I was in Germany, I found out I made general. Congratulations. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, some days so I wonder, right? I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So how does that make you feel, finally achieving that type and kind of rank, being a black man? Okay, and, all right, we could be here all day on that. <laughs> we could be here all day. I, I don't think a lot of people really grasp the, the stress. And what year was this? What year was uh, oh, 20, oh man, you were asked, 2018. Okay. All right, so when I found out, I, I didn't even know I made general. So let, let me be clear on this one. Uh, I was never, I wasn't really looking for it. I thought I was, I was competitive, but I didn't think I was really looking for it. Um, my goal was to do my time at, at J3 and then come back to Florida. And What's J3? Uh, the Joint Operations 3 at, at McDill. Because I'm in, I'm in, I'm working for the J3 in, uh, in Germany. And so my time was to finish my time as a colonel and then retire. Um, when I hit my 30. And when I found out I made general, it kind of threw my plans off. But the, it didn't hit me about being a general until one day I was at, um, and I have, I'll have to keep from crying on this because it kind of threw me off. Uh, I was at Dix, uh, Fort Dix. Um, New Jersey. New Jersey. And after I'd pinned general already, I was in the um, PX or BX, whichever one, whichever preference you use. At AFES? Yeah, at AFES. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm standing there, and this lady comes by and stops me. And she goes, are you a general? And I, and I, and I was, yeah. I said, yeah. And she goes, and she touched my ring, and she goes, you're the first black general I've ever seen. And she was an older lady from the 60s or 70s. And I stood there and I said, oh, yes, ma'am. And she goes, my husband lived his whole life wanting to meet a black general. And so I can go to his grave and I tell him I met one. Wow. And I don't think people understand how that impacted me. That, that's when I realized the rarity of a person of color wearing that rank, especially an African American. And then the next time was I met a man, in a, a veteran in a wheelchair, he's a Vietnam vet, and he, I was joking with him. And I was in uniform, he, cause, because we don't wear a rank on our collars, he didn't realize it was all in the middle of my chest. He just, he just didn't realize it. And he's in his wheelchair, and he goes, hey, hey, young guy, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. He goes, so what rank are you? Uh, Sergeant Major, uh, 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 Sergeant Major, Staff Sergeant? I said, well, no, I'm a general. And he goes, ah, you why are you BS and messing around with me? He goes, you're joking. He goes, there's no way you can be joking. I'm in uniform, but he doesn't see that. He's looking at my collar for the rank. And his wife goes, I think he actually is a general. And he looks, he goes, show me. And I, and I point to him on my chest, and he sees the star. And he literally, I mean, he almost went to tears, and he grabbed my hand. And he's just like, you're the first black girl I've ever met in my life. He goes, I was in the Army 20 years, and I never met a black general. So that, within my first six months of putting that star on, God put these people in my way, and it made me realize the rarity of being in that 1%, but it, the burden also. And, and I'm saying that, and everybody can disagree or whatever, I really could care less, but there is a burden that you carry because you have a responsibility. And I, and I tell people all the time, and they, they get upset when I say this, and I, I'm okay with it, that for 10.8 million 
slaves that were sent to North America. I represent them because if they survived conditions that I would have probably never been able to survive. And because one or two of them survived those, those conditions, I was able to reach the rank of general, which means that every day, it's not that I work for Vince Bugs, I actually work for people that never had an opportunity to follow their dreams. So I took it very serious, not just being a general. I took it very serious that I was a, a African-American general that had a responsibility <coughs> to our society and to prove to other um, people of color and minorities that if you know you got to work hard, you can you can get where you need to be because um, people take it for granted. Some people actually believe that that's what they should get. It's more important when you get something than when you're not expecting it, but you make sure that you respect it when you do get it. You know, so that's uh, so my, that's my dissertation on on, on making general. Okay. Um. So you made general, and where are you then? Okay, so Fort Dix, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey at the time. And how long were you stationed there? Okay, so when I got to Fort Dix, we were doing operations. So I was commander of a unit in Washington State, and so the way the reserves work, I was reserve general. So I had my units in Washington State, but my units were all exercising at Fort Dix. So I was at Fort Dix between Fort Dix and that for about a month and a half. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I was at I was uh, but I did my two years at Washington State. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was traveling all over because I had where, where in Washington State? Um, Marysville, because I had we had the naval base up in Marysville because we had I was responsible for all Army Reserve sustainment units that were in the Northwest. You said naval base. I'm, I'm not familiar, so I think it granted it was on the coast. Yes, yes. Okay. Of Seattle, right. Puget okay. Sound. Uh, and how long were you there? You um, said, about 18 months. Okay. 18 months. All right. Yeah. Next, next. anybody get hurt? Any casualties? No, you know, I dealt with the normal thing with the, with the, the military, uh, on the Army side. We dealt with, you know, personal actions. We dealt with UCMJ. I mean, people getting in trouble with military uh, law. And, uh, and and the sad thing, I, and I'll say it because it, it should always be addressed, and it dealt with suicide. You know, uniform military, uniform code of military justice. Thank you. Yeah, and then we and I dealt with suicides because we had at the time the army had an epidemic and and we still struggle with it to this day of, of soldiers, non combat related soldiers, uh, having problems with anxiety and stress. And so I did a lot of dealt with a lot of people that were going through um, some transitions, and we were trying to make sure that we worked our butts off to make sure that we prevented, uh, did everything we could to prevent a suicide, but everything that people got help. And how long were you in Washington State? Uh, that's right. Yeah. It was about eight, eight, 18 months because then I got picked up for another job. Okay. Um, what year is this by now? Oh, right now we're in our 20s. We're in the 20s. Now, okay. 2020. All right. All right. Here we go. 2020? Yeah, right. right. about 20, yeah, 2019, 2020. Yeah, and okay. then I went to the 5th Army out in, um, out in San Antonio. And then I, I worked those operations for COVID with... Uh, for how long? Oh, uh, I want to say about a year. Okay. Yeah. COVID? When yeah, you know, we were sending medical teams to hospitals to help out with COVID. Okay. That, that, that was one thing. I also worked in the border issues. And you said you're in Texas, right? Yeah, in Texas. How close to the border? Oh uh, no, I was in San Antonio, but we'd go down to El Paso to the border and you know work those issues uh, with. The, what were you you saying? Work those? What were your dealings? Uh, my my dealings was to support the border patrol, making sure that we had outlook posts and and people watching them, helping watch the border and notify the proper authorities to uh, apprehend people. Casualties? Uh, I didn't. Uh, That's we, injuries. And or death. Right. I understand. All right. At this point, I didn't. I wasn't tracking that we had any casualties. I know we probably had some mental stress. So, but overall, I I, I don't recall us having any major casualties with that. With because we really didn't. Our our duty because of the because of different laws that we're we're not allowed to um, engage the, uh, uh, the people coming across the border. Uh, Face to face, we were the only supposed to report because they were not the enemy. Right. Okay, so um, 
Was this the last year you said? Yeah, and, and it was, and it was, and it was a, um, it was a challenge at duty station. It was one of the first times in my military career I, I actually had no desire to. T I actually was looking forward to retiring just because of uh, just personalities, um, because of just way things were predicated. It was, it wasn't up to the quality of, of what I expected. Um, and just the, um, it's just the sheer environment was, was uh, semi not conducive to me uh, as far as, I think some of it was a little bit toxic and, and I hate to say it that way because everybody would be, oh my God, he should never use that term. But you know, it's, been, it's Vince's truth, it's my reality, it's my, um, my, um, my, my, my journey of how I felt. And so I looked I look forward when it was time for me to, to, to hang up my spurs, I was okay with it. And this, the statement that you just made is all the relevancy had to do with that job at the border. With part of it, the job at the border, part of it, uh, uh, just perception of uh, how people see the world. And, and I honestly, I'm going to go down this road, even though I try not to as a general, is um, politics, people rely on their political perspectives to get in way of their judgment. And they had, and some people had lost sight that what was important is that the the not the Amer the American flag, but what's also important is the American people, but our oath, you know, um, and the oath is that we support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and not uh, depend on what political party I work with. And I think um, the the officers that wrote in the Wall Street Journal recently. Are just, are just reinforcing my same comment that I'm making now that I saw. Oh. Um, just a few more questions. Okay. All right. uh, two things. Yes. I'm going to ask you two things. One has to do with your worldview. Okay. About the, I guess the, how should I say, the, the presence that we're in or what what we're experiencing today right. uh, especially since you brought up you know what, what you've been through at, at the border um, so just take it all in for a minute I'm gonna try to give these to you so we can wrap up okay yeah. all right um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general how did your service and experiences affect your life? And if you don't mind stating what your worldview is today, okay. um, in 2022, since um, you know we've had discussion about situations uh, that we're all experiencing in the country, and um, I'm, I'm very interested in your worldview. Okay. So, all right. So, how has the military? Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, I think what my influence about war um, was kind of preset because uh, my grandfather fought in World War II, and I was able to talk to him. And then, you know, my dad fought in Vietnam, and I saw the hostilities of our nation against my dad and and his brothers and sisters when they came back from Vietnam. So my, my predestined was that after the first Gulf War, going in and seeing everybody pull together after the first Gulf War, is that um, my perceptions of war were that there, there are times in a place where uh, we're responsible for protecting and defending the nation. 9-11 um, is a great example of us don't having to go do a job, a tough job. And so my perception that during 9-11 was there was an intimate threat. We had a responsibility to meet, meet that requirement at all costs just to make a difference. So, um, yes, I do have pre-existing thoughts, but my grandfather and my dad all talked about what's important about, you know, serving your country and then putting your best foot forward. And if sometimes you may have to put your life on the line uh, for the beliefs of this nation, regardless if the nation does what it's supposed to do as, a, as, a, as you know, um, in correlation to our relationship as, as being African-Americans or, or whatever. Okay. And 
your worldview. Right. What is your what is your take? Everything that you've been through, everything you've observed, um, the um, the ladder that you have climbed and ascended for your own success. Um, you know, you have a, a vast journey that you've traveled right. militarily. And also you've had experience traveling in the world. Right. Okay, so I believe you said you uh, you went and entered into the service. Uh, um, after the ROTC, you were 25 years old, um, you're 57 now. Yes. <laughs> and so that's, that's a quarter of a century. Yes. A quarter of a century of experience. So, what is your take on where we're at today, militarily, but also, I'm curious, because um, uh, I, I know that you've had the experience of um, dealing with corporate situations. Right. So that's government and private. And if you can just give me a summation, okay. of because uh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure you've given that a world of thought. I have. Thank you. Um, I think we've taken about 20 year steps back uh, to where we should be and it's due to maybe uh, political ideologies if you're a Republican, Democrat, or Independent here or there. Um, so many people, and, and even in the Army, and I saw it, even though they probably vo didn't vocalize it, they, uh, they were so hard bent on their political platform or their political perspective. And, and when I hear people say, when you're in uniform, everybody's green, Oh, well, if that was the case, you know, many years ago when I used to hear when we were going through the 80s, uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, consideration of others. And I told someone one day, I said, well, we wouldn't have to do consideration. Somebody goes, why do we have to do consideration of others? I said, because we still have racism and the equal opportunity uh, is still a problem here. And it's not just women. So we went through a phase for me and you talk about my journey. So when I first went in the military, we were still dealing with the civil rights uh, remnants of civil rights. So they had consideration of others, which means you need to pay attention to other people of color, or other people that don't look like you and treat them with respect. And so I told people, you know, why, why do we have to have this training? Well, we wouldn't have to have this training if everybody was treating everybody with respect. Then we went through the, the training for women, you know, because of, of the different tail hook, the different incidences with women. And so I watched that process uh, go through um, during the, uh, the 90s and then we ended up you know now and and now is interesting is because we have so many opportunities and we should be so far down the road we have less african-american journals and everybody will go well the number is high well when you consider when you walk in a room of 130 and you only have two african-american and three african-american journals I'm sorry news flash you're not where you need to be um, and then I hear people constantly saying that, you know, when I was in, oh, we're working hard to, uh, the, the, the rhetoric, we're working hard to get more females and African Americans uh, or just people of color in key positions. But when you, when you talk on that line, then you need to be at the four-star level, at the three-star level, and then there needs to be opportunities. The, the, the opportunities don't really exist. And it definitely... If, if I'm at a four-star command or a three-star command, the first thing I would ever ask any junior uh, general or any junior colonel that's getting out of the military, or why are you leaving? What is what you know? What's the deal? We don't do a very good job of uh, of keeping the people in, and so what we do is every time we downsize the military, and I saw it twice. I saw it in the '90s and I saw it in the mid 2000s. We kept the 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 colonels and the generals, and we got rid of the majors and the captains. Uh, if, if I can give any advice, that makes no sense. Crazy. Why did we do that? You, you don't get rid of your future for your past. And we constantly hold on to our past and don't look at our future. So the next time the Army does a downsize, they might want to cut the top and keep the bottom. Uh, and, and it just may work out better in the numbers. But as um, my world view of being around the world is that we got a little bit of a long way to go. We shouldn't be, we should not be where we're at right now. We should be a lot further along. We should not even be discussing right in the 20, 20th, uh, in the 21st century, we're still discussing issues of color in the military. We're still, still discussing uh, respect for women in the military. We're still discussing um, uh, ratios and, and quotas on how many people we got where. 
and then we and constantly come back to this this rhetoric of what well, it looks like it's okay. Well, it depends on where you sit at the table when you say it's okay. You know, at one point all the sergeant majors were pretty much predominantly of color, but all the colonels were a predominantly uh, European American. I mean, I don't say I don't realize if anybody sees the issue with this, or you walk in every room. Uh, federal building and you look up at the wall and there's no one that looks like half the population and the military is like 57 percent minority yet when you 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 peel the onion back and look at leadership <laughs> the numbers are not do not equate to the population so i, I you know i, I you know and I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir but like everything else, it either falls on ears that are dead or ears that you know don't like to hear hear the truth. And the truth is, we got we got work to do, and the, and the army uh, really needs to take their work a little bit more serious and 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 put the and put it in uh, not just in writing, but they need to make sure they show their actions by giving people opportunities. I love the army. Don't get me wrong. The army afforded me. Tons of opportunities I would have never gotten in the civilian world. Would have just never gotten. They they afforded me, like my grandfather said, even though he fought in a, a segregated army in World War II and in Vietnam, my dad said things were still segregated, even though they said they weren't, even though Truman integrated, they were still kind of segregated because there were black tents and white tents. He said, uh, in the end, you know, when funny is when everybody starts shooting, how everybody comes together. You know, or if something everybody forgets about color, he used to tell me. And it's funny, during 9-11, that kind of came to mind. It was one of the things I thought about when I was in Iraq, is that when uh, we started getting in uh, situations, how all of a sudden everybody was on the same team. So I'm like, why can't we be on the same team when we're not being shot at and we're not being uh, threatened? So we got a little bit of work to do. And, uh, and in the end, um, it's leadership. And it's the people at the top need to take what they do a little bit more serious when it comes to integration. And, uh, and they'll say, oh, we're integrated. Okay, it depends on when you look at numbers. And giving people opportunity. Uh, the Marines just went through a massive thing of having a couple colonels of color that should have been promoted to general, and they were just kind of given, being forced to, I would say, they were behooved to make them generals their generals now. We shouldn't have, we'd never be in these situations. We shouldn't, this stuff should not even be in the news. We shouldn't have to have, have these discussions right now in the 21st century, but yet we still are. We have a long way to go. Okay. Last question. So, well, directly, how did how did your service and experiences affect your life? How, so, how has all of this affected you? So, after thirty years of service, well, more yeah, about thirty years of service, um, how does it affect me? It made me realize one important thing is that to to make this situation better in the world and do my part, I started teaching school, teaching uh, uh, adjunct college professor, um, teaching high school. Because the thing is, is that I can't fix what's in front of me. I can only fix what's behind me, which is the kids that are coming up behind me that are going to be the next generation and make the next impression. And so my goal has always been to make the next version of Americans a lot better than the version that we have right now because the next version can do so much better. They, they have technology in their favor. They have communication in their favor. They have um, just so many tools and instruments that, that we've created in their favor. Uh, I, I look at it as my duty as a, as a retired officer, my duty as an American citizen is to make sure that I give all the knowledge I have so the next generation can aspire to inspire themselves to be the best version of themselves. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? No, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, uh, to, to discuss, you know, my journey. You know, it, it, it's unique. But I want the last thing I want to leave is that anybody that believes they can do something, keep dreaming, and you can, you can actually aspire uh, to be a general yourself, because I remember when I asked uh, someone when I was a second lieutenant, I told him one day I wanted to be a general, General Durgans. I said, I want to be a general. He says, well, good luck with that. Well, sir, uh, good luck. I, it, there was some luck involved, yes, and I made general. So don't ever stop believing or dreaming, because uh, there are going to be people who tell you you can't do it, but you can. But just remember, never destroy anybody's career to get there. Okay. I'd like to thank you for a great interview. 
And I'd also like to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure.